Yeah. Okay, because uh, yeah, Klaus said after the break, please no detail, right? Um, and uh, hopefully I am able to answer most of your questions uh, over the break. I know a lot of you, more than actually we thought, have been working on smaller systems. And um, when you, I just wanted to tell you today when you work with, <coughs> with Mo, um, it does have the, the charm and amber, not the feeling of the 22, or uh, amber or charm 22 there, but it does have the Merc force field uh, in there, which is sort of the class two uh, force field we talked about uh, that you could use, and you could take a look at that, uh, maybe even try to do the parameterization with it and see what, it, what you get and compare it. Is it. One of the things about this class two force field is that uh, I called it transferability, good for organic combinatorical studies. Uh, the way I look at it, they always give me an answer, which is sometimes a good thing, because you get to use some plates and everything on. And, um, but you always have to analyze what you get. Um, so please take a look. If there's another option, you can always go back and do that this afternoon. For those of you working, I think that you were, had a question of your, with your collaboration with organic the organic chemistry colleagues, okay? The other thing that I'd like to have some of you do, is I said, this is an attempt that we did, and I think we explained what, uh, how we came about, sort of changing this and putting a, a little bit of the first step of going towards a more uh, complete uh, optimization. As I said, if you've been uh, uh, thinking more like an organic chemist, I would have really changed my definition of what I'm calling a group for the last part of this um, system <coughs> here. And, um, and maybe made another choice about when we connected them here. If one of you wants to try to do that and um, calculate uh, the ESP and the RESP um, uh, charges for this, sending it off to games, I would certainly appreciate that. And because and, uh, otherwise, I know Romy will be doing that this week. Uh, herself, this is part of her project, so it may be something where you can sort of compare notes if you like. Um, okay. Um, yeah, now I w wanted to go on and give you uh, one example of uh, what I would call more hybrid force field uh, calculations. Uh, you know, besides uh, going back and looking at reactivity uh, into those areas of uh, protein folding, we also want to make advantage, you know, uh, steps forward. And we have been using, as I said, primarily coarse grained um, uh, potentials that I showed you the first part of the talk. It would be interesting and to uh, put in a more full atom description. Uh, because the final stages uh, of uh, folding, and particularly in those plateau regions, we want to get the side chain packing uh, correct. So it's sort of just a preliminary exercise, and this has really been only completed since by like about a, a week, I think, by one of my students, is Taras Pogorelov, who will also be at, I don't think he's at today's tutorial. He does the one on bioinformatics tomorrow. I'm just going to show you sort of a, a simple of example of where we've added some of those knowledge-based potentials, uh, one very similar to what I showed you in the first part of the tar talk, just added it to the charm potentials. And we've added it in terms of, uh, in the format we call uh, a, a Go potential, it's supposed to be named after Professor Go of uh, Japan, who's sort of one of the first people to look at sort of uh, the notion of protein folding and the idea that 
certain parts seem to fold very easily because you have very, what he calls consistent, not frustrated uh, type of interactions. In our language, what we did, when we're building in sequence structure patterns, we put in the known native structure there. So it only reinforces things that are native-like in the, in the folding. And we added it to the Go potentials, a little bit stronger than is perhaps really uh, it should be, but I just wanted to get a movie <laughs> that would show you folding with the side chains on there and with these hybrid methods. So um, there's a typical configuration that you start with any of these ab initio methods that you use in protein folding. It's, un it's extended. Uh, the groups we've highlighted, we've highlighted them for a reason because we're doing our simulations and looking at particular mutants that a colleague of mine is experimentally looking at. And we're just trying to tell him which are fast folders, which are slow folders. So at the end of this, we will also use some histogram techniques to calculate the free energy uh, uh, barriers. And then he doesn't tell us beforehand, and we'll sort of see how good this method is. And so far, it's been working actually extremely well. Um, the red um, portions indicate what will be a helix in the final structure. And this molecule is the lambda repressor, and this is one of the mutants. There is uh, some stabilization that occurs through these two mutants. They're both aromatic rings that are interact with one another. I'll cycle through again. And you'll see it starts collapsing, and then there's sort of a one, in one part of the trajectory is a very sudden motion, and it gets sort of the right uh, tertiary uh, interactions. And We'll run it one more time. Now, again, uh, I, as I said, I think it's very important that in, in doing, in, in dealing with these hybrid methods, you've got to ask the right questions, right? So, um, like with protein folding, um, we use uh, potentials that are designed and optimized to give you interactions that are seen in the native state. So. Uh, I don't care so much about the dynamics. I care about the end state. So there are going to be different energy functions, say, than what you'll use if you're trying to look at something uh, at a binding site. And you really care about the mechanism and particular dihedrals and certain motions. Um, here we're beginning to bridge into that realm of kinetics. But again, I'm asking very simple questions. I just want to know if I put those mutants in there, do I get a barrier or do I not get a barrier? And um, that's easier to ask than other, uh, it's not such a detailed question and I can try to do something with it. So let me show you some of the, the, the molecules. Oh, no. All right, so these are like typical things that, um, that my colleague would tell me, oh, I've got a mutant here, or I have a different mutant here, and we build those in uh, on the computer, you know, minimize it, uh, unfold the thing, and then do our runs, and calculate using some simple hi histograms just to get a rough idea whether it is downhill folding. So Q here of about a 0.6 means essentially it's folded. Oftentimes we just don't wait long enough for this thing to get into really the fine folded state. This one obviously gets sort of caught here and would be like a two-state, what we call a two-state folder. So we would tell him fast, slow. And then you go, okay, do another. And, um, and then we sort of gather our statistics. <clears throat> now, um, I just want to tell you briefly, uh, of course, all these, these work that you're seeing here besides being able to pull off the nice data from um, from McCrell's website, which I really do encourage all of you to look at if you are using the charm force field and to read the articles and the supplementary material. A lot of the uh, fine print <clears throat> I try to put onto this, these slides, but are, it's in the supplementary material, and he just gives you the 
sort of the broad outlines in the papers. Um, and the work on the tutorials was done by these three people. Romy and Felix are members of my group, and Rosemary is with the resource. And I'm going to ask Romy uh, to come up and then give you a little bit of a movie way of motivation of why we were asking you guys to look at uh, his H and his F. But let me see if I, I hope I put in this one last slide. Uh, well, yeah, one of the exercises that you're going to be asked to do is to look at that tr catalytic triad and to investigate the states of protonation or the units that are around there. And if, and if you have not opened up the topology file ever and looked into it, under the histidine, you'll see that there are several different forms of it. And uh, Felix has been so kind as to go into the PDB file that you'll do your minimization on and I think change them all to have the right state of protonation uh, that, that we've inferred from the biochemical calculations. So this one is a neutral histidine and there's another isomer of it. So you can see that there'll be hydrogens will be at various places on these rings. And then there's an also another file that's in there for histidine when it's protonated. So, and they'll each have a different atom name. So when you're running simulations, one of the first things you'll have to do besides, you know, just assigning charges from things that are in the charm force field, you have to make a judgment about what should be the states of protonation. Uh, or, and, and if that will also judge which of these residues you will be assigning it uh, to. Uh, it's, it's in our exercise, I think in some of the examples that McCrell gives, he, he doesn't really stress that point um, enough and that is a really a common error that many students make as they get started. So um, if there are no further questions, um, then I'd like to have Romy, there she is, um, uh, start her uh, movie on, uh, on uh, his age. Let me just hook this up here. All right, is that, yeah, you guys got me. Okay, so hi, my name is Romy Amaro. I'm a second year graduate student, I guess going on to my third year now um, in the Luthi Shulton group. And the tutorial that you guys have today, you're gonna be specifically looking at a system that I'm very familiar with and most of the people in my group. It's, um, as Zan already prefaced, it's the it's involved in the synthesis of histidine, which is an essential amino acid. And we're looking at the fifth step of the histidine biosynthetic pathway. Got it. Um, and the, the name of the enzyme is aminosyl glycerol phosphate synthase, which is a bit of a mouthful. It's actually a pretty cool enzymatic system. So now that Zan has done all the boring parameterization stuff, I get to do a little bit of the more glamorous um, presentation here, but it's all tied in together. So HIS-H, there's two proteins involved here, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. HIS-H is a class one glutamine aminotransferase. As she said, it binds a molecule of glutamine, hydrolyzes it to form a molecule of glutamate and ammonia. And then the ammonia diffuses across the interface to the second protein here, which is called HIS-F. And that's an alpha beta barrel protein that, um, that performs a cyclase reaction. And then later on, that, that the ammonia, the nitrogen ammonia, the nitrogen in ammonia is incorporated into the histidine ring. So recently, it was suggested that HIS-F uses its alpha beta barrel structure to transport in a directed way the ammonia that's released in the HIS-H reaction. And this was um, something that was suggested, but really there was no concrete experimental evidence. So what I get to do right now is show you, um, highlight some of the, the conclusions from some work that we just finished regarding the ammonia conduction and also another interesting aspect of the system, um, which is its gating mechanism. 
uh, that his F has. And then I'm sort of going to use that to motivate why we will want to, or why we want to right now, model a more complete comp complex, which is associated with an activated form of the enzyme, and that has required parameterization both for his, for his H, which is what you guys are going to take a look at, this thioester parameterization in the tutorial today, and then some more involved uh, parameterization for his F, which you guys won't do. Okay, so this is his H. It's an alpha beta protein. It's a Rossman fold. Um, it has this is its catalytic triad, which corresponds to cysteine 84, histidine 178, and glutamate 180. This is the, the protein that you guys are primarily going to be working with, with today in the tutorial. This is its partner in crime, his F. It's an alpha beta barrel. You can sort of see the, the beta sheets in, on the interior of the protein, and it's flanked by by uh, alpha helices. The active site um, is on the C-terminal end, which is a common theme for these alpha beta barrels. And this N-terminal side over here is where his H will dock to it. So this is the top view. You can see at the back end there, I've highlighted the two active site residues. One of the really interesting things about this system is that there are four conserved gate residues. These are strictly conserved across all domains of life. And they form, we have two glutamates, an arginine and a lysine, and they form really stable salt bridges. Now, one of the things is the ammonia that's produced in the His-H reaction, and I'll illustrate this in a couple slides, is needs to pass through this gate. And roughly the diameter and all the crystal structures corresponds to about three angstroms of a gate diameter, which is, is kind of small. So also something that's, that's interesting is that predominantly this, this channel is hydrophobic. There are, however, four or five conserved hydrophilic residues that line the length of the channel. And I'll discuss a little bit about um, their function uh, coming up. So this is the docked complex crystal structure. You can see here we have his H docked on the N-terminal side of his F. So there's the catalytic triad. And this is, this is the gate here that it has to go through. And the ammonia is going to try to get down here to the other end. Okay, so this is a hypothetical coupling mechanism, and um, I'm not showing you snapshots from a trajectory or anything. I'm just illustrating what's going on. So the two proteins are docked in solution. Then you have a molecule of glutamine that binds to the cysteine covalently. And then we have a second substrate that docks on the C-terminal end of this alpha beta barrel right there. That's called PARFAR. It's a, a larger molecule. As you know, I think Zan mentioned, in this step, it's, it's a pretty critical step because on one hand, you have a product that goes off to form histidine, and on the other hand, you have something called AICAR, which um, goes off in the production of de novo purine. So it's, it's um, a ribotide. So, all right, so PARFAR binds, and then it's thought now that this binding of this second substrate here actually initiates some kind of activated event or subtle conformational change that not only drives this reaction, this reaction up here in HIS-H will only happen when this second substrate is bound, but also possibly this binding may induce some kind of activated event that will open up this gate. And that, there's no experimental evidence for that as of yet. Okay, so once that, once PARFAR binds, the, um, the, the reaction goes, ammonia is released, and then it diffuses across the interface, roughly 10 angstroms to the mouth of his F. And then it passes through the channel another 15 angstroms. So it takes us about 10 angstroms to get from here to here, and this is about 15 to get to the next active site to participate in the next reaction. Okay, so what's known experimentally? There were crystal structures that came out in 2001 of both the bacterial and eukaryotic organisms, but they didn't have any substrates bound. It was just the his F and the his H components docked. And that's, that, but that was our starting point for our simulations. They also had done mutational studies involving some, and this was pre-crystal structure determination, but um, mutational studies involving some of these residues that they had thought were involved in the reaction. And they found out that two of the gating residues, they only did it on, there are four of those gate residues, two of them were um, definitely playing essential roles in reaction, meaning they mutated it and the, the reaction kinetics were destroyed. 
And the only other thing that we knew going into this was that the activity of his H, that reaction happening is dependent on the second substrate binding to his F. Okay, so one of the, just to reiterate, um, this sort of novel function for this ubiquitous fold. Most of you or some of you may know that the alpha beta fold itself is a very common enzymatic structure and it's used throughout nature to perform a bunch of different kinds of, of, of actual reactions. Um, and substrate channeling in general is common to glutamine aminotransferases. So um, I think I told you this is a class one glutamine, glutamine aminotransferase. And most of these or all of these aminotransferases are coupled to a second reaction that requires this active form of ammonia. One of the, of course, there are advantages to channeling and, and directing intermediates. Of course, it affords protected travel, like if you don't want it to escape out into the bulk solution, possibly getting protonated. Also, it's a directed travel. And in a sense, when you couple these two reactions, of course, you're going to have increased enzymatic regulation, which is also of critical importance for these biological systems. And one of the cool things about this particular system, in addition to everything else, is that this is the first time that an alpha beta barrel was proposed to use its barrel structure as an efficient intermediate channel for reactions. So one of the goals of our work was just to see, is it even energetically feasible to have the ammonia pass through and to confirm whether or not that was even a, a viable method of transport for, for an intermediate. Okay, so back quickly to the gate mechanism. Um, as I mentioned before, that those four, those four residues that were on the N-terminal side of the alpha beta barrel seemed to be all crystallized in, in closed conformation. They were all forming the stable salt bridges. The diameter of the gate in those was about 3.2 angstroms. And the diameter of ammonia is about two. So although it could probably get through, it, was gonna be, it looked like a pretty tight fit. But what we did here, um, you could, one could use, a, if, when you're trying to predict what the possible gating mechanism might be. Right, you have these four residues, and you could think that there's rotomer states for any of the four residues. One of the things we did was you can use bioinformatics to sort of narrow the search for possible other partners that the, those residues could be participating with in order to open, to have this gating mechanism. We found, um, doing an analysis, that there are two conserved aspartates near the gate, on either side of the gate, and that salt bridges, alternate salt bridges could be formed between this as one of the aspartates and the lysine of the, of the gate itself, and then one on the other side, an aspartate 219 to the arginine. And when you do that, when it flips it open, it increases the diameter of the gate to about seven angstroms, and we found that this was very stable. So here's the top view again, that's not connected. Um, okay, and you can see here they're pretty closed. So this is just maybe one of the possible thing that could happen. You could have these rotomer states. Let me get that away. There we go. These are so this would be interactions between all the. Con these are all strictly conserved um, residues, and when you do that, it would open it up significantly to allow an easier passage of ammonia. Okay. So what we actually simulated, however, we didn't simulate that open. The both open forms. What we, what we simulated, we followed a suggestion by one of the experimentalists working on the system. And if you take another look at, the, at a sequence alignment, you'll see that there are two strictly conserved residues at the interface. One of them is this lysine of the gate, and the other one is a tyrosine that sticks off into the interface from the other protein, from his H. And if, if this is you know, purely hypothetical, if, if it were to the lysine would be in a rotomer state where it was flipped up and able to hydrogen bond with the tyrosine, it increased the, di the, the diameter of the channel from the 3.2 angstroms present in the crystal structure to about 5.8. So you would think that it would be easier for the ammonia to pass through. And of course, since there was no experimental evidence for a gating mechanism, we also tried to pull it through, we tried to pull the ammonia through the channel in both the closed gate conformation as well as this possible open gate conformation. Okay, so there's the strictly conserved tyrosine I was telling you about that was sticking down into the interface. And if we envision, or if we can imagine that this lysine here, if it's flipped up like this, it gets to within hydrogen bonding distance, and that could be a possible mechanism. Okay, so system setup. Um, 
we started with our 2.4 angstrom resolution crystal structure. As you see here, there's no, we included no substrates at this point. Um, and then, okay, right, we solvated the complex with explicit waters, and then we minimized and equilibrated everything using NAMD2 and the CHARM27 force field in the MPT ensemble. Okay, now I keep saying we're gonna, you know, we pulled this ammonia field, and that's exactly what we did. We used steered molecular dynamics, which you guys heard about last week, uh, to induce the passage of ammonia through the channel on the nanosecond time scale. So in this case, uh, the Hamiltonian of the system becomes the, the, here you have your unperturbed Hamiltonian and then your instantaneous biasing potential. And we pulled the ammonia through the channel at, we use constant velocity steered molecular dynamics, so we pulled it through at 15 angstroms per nanosecond, which roughly meant that we were going, to, for each nanosecond of simulation, we were gonna get one passage of ammonia. And we did that in constant velocity. And then we analyzed the resulting trajectories and forces. And we did this for both the open and closed gate. So here I have a little movie. All right, so here you can see the ammonia. So this is just, I've clipped out everything else and I'm just showing you the ammonia going through the barrel. So you can see the, the alpha beta barrel here. And I have also shown you, and this will loop through, so I'll just talk to you while you watch this. Um, this is that conserved tyrosine. This is the lysine. You can see that it's flipped up. Also, we had to hold this fixed in the simulations. Otherwise, it would close. Um, and then these are the, these residues here are the hydrophilic residues that the ammonia was interacting with as it went through the channel. And you can see that the ammonia, even though we're pulling it, I mean, it's obviously, it's, it's tumbling, it's rotating, and it's able to optimize its, its position, you know, with regards to interacting with these residues. And also it's kind of interesting is the behavior of the water molecules. Um, we found that actually the water molecules didn't behave the same in every simulation. Sometimes they, sometimes we had a, an actual conduction event of a water molecule along with ammonia. Other times we didn't. Sometimes it just, the waters wouldn't, you know, we didn't have one that went all the way through. They would just sort of hang out in the channel and then maybe go back up while the ammonia passed through. Okay. All right, so, and then this is just, um, just to show you guys, this is, this is out of our a paper that actually is gonna get um, published online this week in PNAS. Uh, here what we have, I told you we tried pulling the ammonia through the closed gate just to see roughly the forces that were gonna be involved. And you can see what, what I'm showing you here is just a steep upward curve. And after this, whenever you have high barriers, or what we found was that when we had this tremendously high barrier, it was really difficult actually to use the, the SMD and the Jarzinski identity to reconstruct the potential of, of mean force. Um, because you just have to have tremendous statistics. So we estimate that in order to pull the ammonia through the closed gate, it's gonna be somewhere between 25 and 40 kcals. When we put it into that possible hypothetical open gate where we flip that lysine up and have it hydrogen bond, you can see that now the entrance, the barrier to entrance for the ammonia is much, is much smaller. And these are, these valleys here correspond to specific positions of, of hydrophilic groups that the ammonia was interacting with on its way down and forming hydrogen bonds. So one of the things now that we want to do is, and there's a couple things. Well, first of all, we know that we want to model this more activated complex. You know, we, want, we would like to have both substrates in there at the same time. And possibly, um, in order to do that, we need to first of all, have a covalently bound glutamine glutamate in the HIS-H active site, and then also this other substrate, PARFAR, at the, at the C-terminal end of his f Except that there are no publicly available parameters for parts of the HIS-H substrate. I mean, a lot of them, as you guys are gonna see, and as Zan prefaced before, you can take from existing parameters. But, however, this thioester was not in the CHARM 27. It wasn't part of the force field, so we had to create those parameters. And that's one of the things, that, that's what you guys are gonna do today. We also had to do it for PARFAR, which is much more involved, but you guys aren't gonna go there. And so today's lab exercise is gonna walk you through the parameterization of the HIS-H substrate. All right, so I know Zan put this up before, but just to, to recap, so HIS-H is the glutamine aminotransferase, and it, it has a conserved catalytic triad. We have a cysteine, a histidine, and a glutamate. And so it, this is the full mechanism what happens, there's, there's an attack on the carbonyl here. It goes through a tetrahedral intermediate. 
And then when we get to this step, we end up having a covalently bound glutamyl thioester intermediate, and we have the histidine here, which is, this corresponds to HSD. So you know how Zan just said that there were, for histidine, you can have protonated histidine, obviously. There's two other entries you can have in the charm topology file. You have either HSP, which stands for the protonated, where you'll have both, you'll have an H here and an H here. You'll also have HSD or HSE, depending on which nitrogen, delta or epsilon, you have the hydrogen on. So what, what we model is it in, in today's exercise, you're going to see it's HSD. And actually, when you bring up, when you're in the system and you bring up Mo, you're going to see in the sequence editor, instead of saying, HIS for histidine, it does in fact say HSD, and that corresponds to the specific protonation state that we want to model, okay? And so you can see here that this is corresponding to the, the molecule of ammonia already having been released. Okay, so, and this is also, again, this is all in the little tutorials that you guys have probably already picked up, and this is the stuff we want you guys to focus on. Okay, so, and then I just wanted to sort of preface what you guys are going to do today. I don't know if this will be useful, but it might. Um, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to use VMD to just look at the system, investigate the active site. Then you're going to use MO, um, which is, stands for Molecular Operating Environment. It's another um, modeling package. And you're going to use that to sort of investigate the glutamine approach into the active site. You'll see it's right there when, when you open up the file. And then you're going to use MO to actually make the covalent bond that's present in that step. Um, MO, as Zan said also, it makes, his, it makes an initial approximation. Um, so you're going to, you know, one of, part of the, the problem with parameterizing is, or not problem, but one of the steps to it is identifying what you need to actually parameterize and what kind of things you can derive from other things that are there. So for instance, this bioester linkage you guys are going to need to look more into. Mo will actually make guesses for you. Guesses, I use that loosely. It uses pattern recognition to come up with something based on whatever force field you have happened to read in. In this case, it's, it's charm. Um, and what you're going to do then is, so this is sort of just first to see, you know, an initial approximation. Then you're, we're going to have you do semi-empirical calculations with Spartan. And you're going to geometry optimize it. Again, semi-empirical, I think you're going to use PM3. So it's not ab initio or anything, but it's just it's to get you in the ballpark. Then you're going to compare the results from that of the angles and the bond lengths. You guys are going to go in and measure them. You're going to compare them to what Mo guessed and also to any, any experimental values. And there are experimental values for the thioesters, as she said, from the Cambridge Structural Database and from, from different articles. And then what we're going to have you do is um, we're going to have you look at the, t the torsional potential by doing this dihedral drive. And this is all in the tutorial also. And then, of course, once you have generated all of these um, parameters, you're going to actually try minimization in NAMD2 and then see, look at the results, see how much it changed, et cetera. So it should be pretty interesting. You're not going to see his F actually at all. <laughs> you're just going to look at his H, and you're going to have uh, the, the glutamine covalently bound in there. And that's, that's the exercise for today. OK? That's it. So it should be good. Oh, you didn't have to clap. Um, yeah, if they want to. I don't know if they Yeah. Sure. Yeah. The deviation in the gate diameter. Oh, that was okay. So first of all, let me let me just reiterate. That was just. I mean, we were really playing with the system. We took a look and you know said what could the possible gating mechanism be, right? So what we did was we had the crystal structure. And when I say 3.2, I'm talking about it is just, if you just open up the PDB and you look at the crystal structure, you'd measure about 3.2. When, when you flip that tyrosine up, or the lysine up to the tyrosine to make that hydrogen bond, and then you, the, the problem with, with really with the gate is getting the right plane as to like how you can really estimate the diameter. Um, so we didn't, I didn't take like an average of a bunch of equilibrium The only, we did con what we constrained for the simulation was and this is interesting. And I'll touch on something else. What we we ended up holding the lysine fixed up. However, you know how I showed you that little movie where it could those two residues could also flip outward to 
um, the conserved aspartase. In that case, that, those were two salt bridges that were being formed. And actually what we found in that case was we were able to hold, the gate would stay open for several hundred picoseconds until the ammonia passed through and then it would close behind it. That, so in that case we didn't have to hold anything fixed. But that's not what we actually modeled in the paper. Um, and we did that because really, we, you know, nobody does really know exactly what's going on there yet and we thought since the, since the suggestions had already been laid forth and that we would go through with. It would, cl it would close. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, it raises a lot, you know, what exactly is happening and possibly also um, to motivate the, to tie in the parameterization stuff, it could be that when we actually are simulating, I mean, it would be really great if we could see, you know, when we have the, the substrate built in there, if, if it's possible that we could actually see maybe some kind of conformational change. We already know from preliminary simulations that the, when we have the PARFAR bound underneath, that the fluctuations in the gate, in their movement. Yeah, that's what I thought. Maybe it's possible because of the dynamics of the way the water travels. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 yeah, right, and the ammonia could pass through. Yeah, that's, it's a total, yeah, it's possibility. Sorry. Sorry. Runs? Did it did it take? Um, like how long did it take to do all that? Um, okay, well, for the closed gate, this was initially what we tried. This was actually this was a, obviously a big learning experience for for me, and I think this is also sort of a new method. So, um, for the closed gate, we ran like forty nanoseconds worth of trajectories, roughly. We had a lot, like we had these repeated nanosecond runs, and this is like about 55,000 atoms. So on NCSA, that's where we did actually most of the, the computing. We also ran at Pittsburgh. On NCSA, on 128 nodes using NANDU2, to do the SMD for one nanosecond, it took us roughly 24 hours, which is awesome. But we had to do that like 40 times. Well, no, 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 each simulation was about a nanosecond and then you repeat that. You have to repeat that from a, you know, the equilibrium, from an equilibrium configuration from the start. 15 angstroms per nanosecond, right. So we could have probably pulled it slower and had them take longer and maybe then we could have done less of them. So that's sort of a, a judgment call. Now for the, for the open gate simulation, because the barrier was lower, we found that we needed less to reconstruct the, using the Dresinski identity, the fluctuations were, were less great, so we were able to get our the variance in the work down faster than we were for the for the closed gate. No problem. Yeah. Or oh, sorry, I'm not in control. Well, um, well, first of all, there's because of the, the system of the, the setup of the system and the stoichiometry of the, the biochemistry. At any one point, you know, you have one molecule of glutamine. You're going to get one molecule of ammonia coming out of there. So, as far as ammonia ammonia interactions, we're probably not going to see that happen. You know what I mean? You're going to have one ammonia in interface at any time. Also, you know it. Um, it it's, it's, it, it, there are questions still as to this interface, it changes. I mean, this is a dynamic system, right? So there's the, the, the two can come together and sort of close off the interface and make it, it it's, it's unclear. And if you look at the different crystal structures, the, uh, the quantity of water molecules inside the interface is not consistent. Sometimes it, it, it's pretty hydrophobic. Other times you'll see that they've, they've put more in there and it, it, they all correspond to the different, sometimes the crystal structures are slightly more open, the interface, in talking in terms of the accessibility to the bulk solvent. Um, so the question, I mean, I guess your question is how, how, how the interactions with water could change
it, well, as it goes through the channel, actually, um, we, do, we did see that it, it interacts with the water molecules as well, and they seem especially important in when, when you're making these, when you're breaking, making and breaking the hydrogen bonds as you're, you know, interacting with the residues, then maybe what it'll do is, you know, the ammonia has a hydrogen bond with um, the serine or whatever, and then as it goes down, it, it interacts with the water until it gets to the next one, sort of, in that sense. Okay. Okay. Um, when I refer to open and close, really, let me, I'll just say it one more time. The closed gate is really the only thing that anybody has any experimental evidence for at this point, publicly published. Um, Structure-wise. Structure mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, 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 yeah. Are you from Purdue? Oh, well, maybe we can talk afterwards. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, okay, so now I've, in my excitement, I've lost the, the question. Um, oh, right, okay, so what we did was, yeah, right, so this is a, okay. Okay, we, okay, uh, let me just answer that. It's easier if we do it one at a time. <laughs> okay, what, what we held fixed in the simulation that we published was, the lysine up in, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, we, you can, const yeah, you, you, you can, we constrained it so that it would, it still can move, like those hydrogens can still move around, but we wanted it to be close enough at all times in the simulation to have this hydrogen bond so that can serve tyrosine as well. Okay, so that was our main concern. We didn't want it to fall back into the, the plane of the gate where it's gonna form these really stable salt bridges you know, that's more stable than, than the hydrogen bond that we had forced it up into. So that's why we had to pull back there. Okay, any other final questions? When I say open? Um, Is, is something that we, when I say the open structure, and maybe if, if I'm not understanding her question correctly, I, I, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm speaking of open for the rest of the work that we've been talking to. Oh, yeah, you open. can ask me afterwards. Uh,
traditional DJ family that my sister is. Yeah, okay. Um, we tried several different simulations. I mean, that's what we did. We took the top tile that we had built with stuff that we had all been using for years. Oh, here we go. Yeah, yeah. You guys, you first saw it. This is first. This is our the really how we made it. Okay, so this is our first
Okay, so like for the for the for the other for the other substrate at the other end. Well, initially, in um, some simulations, I just this is all stuff that is really in the works right now. Um, we we built it first using um, was it Mo? <coughs> uh, I think we pretty much first built Mo and then Spartan, and we did sort of the same kind of thing with geometry optimization. Um, but now, actually, just recently, and they're they're still they're on hold. There's a PDB structure now with those substrates in there. So of course, once we get our hands on that, that's probably where we're gonna have you know we're gonna have to check what we built with with what now is available experimentally for that. Does that answer your question? <laughs> that's a possibility. Yeah, that's a possibility. Well, we did not in, in our simulations that did not include the substrate. We didn't. There was no. I mean, the fluctuations were really minimal, and that's one of the reasons why we went ahead and bent it open into that open state. We're hoping with the inclusion of these substrates that maybe we can get some kind of idea of this activated event that happens upon binding, or that there'll be more. To go in there and break. It's a possible. You think it's a possibility, but I'll tell you, if, if we simulated it for a long time, you know, just without, just letting it go, like in equilibration, and we didn't really see any water molecule moving away, in, you know, its way in there and, and, and flipping it up. I mean, maybe that's a possibility if we continue to simulate for, you know for a lot longer than we did, but I mean, there's computational restraints also. You know, maybe you'd see that if you did it for like a microsecond. Yes, yeah, sorry. Okay. So I have a more technical question concerning potential swimming pools. Mm -hmm. What is the water channel? And it seems here, uh, the water also plays some role, and is my understanding. And my question is, how do you eliminate the possibility of having, for example, a two-dimensional potential swimming pool? where the second dimension is some kind of collected rhythm of the water. And do you have a consistent way of checking if one dimensional potential swimming pool is good enough to describe the system? Or not? Um, do we have, I mean, yeah, sure, no, you can.
Yeah, no, I mean, I hadn't. I, uh, yeah. I don't know. What number, what number of shoots do you have? Um, in, in the channel yeah. at any given time? Um, well, immediate, immediate to the ammonia, there's always at least one or two. Um, it's single file, but it's not always connected all the way through. It's not like you know those carbon nanotubes where they always saw the you know the the un just unruptured file. It was more um, just local to the ammonia, one or two water molecules. Yeah, I was curious if one can look at like a surface, for example, and say that okay, this I mean this where the most kilometers there is a problem. Is there a criteria by one to say one dimension is enough? Actually. Yeah. Oh yeah, certainly. And it's You'll never, you mean even, even sample it. I mean, I guess that's a limitation of yeah, the technique.
There are there are there are a few kinetic experiments um, like they know the you know the rates of, of both of the isolated reactions but in terms of the overall reaction it seems like it, there are there are experimental reactions and these just came out um, a, n a new set there ha it hasn't been totally very well studied I mean there's really just a few experiments um, with these uncoupled reactions and their and their turnover rates. And then just recently, Janet Smith published two papers that just came out. They're not even in print yet. It's all pre-release online, um, where they seem to have over, overall times for the reaction. And yeah, but there are. Mm -hmm. Are you from her group? Or no? Oh, you just know of her. <laughs> Darn it. OK. We'll talk at lunch. OK. Yeah, everything's just going to be in gas phase. Well, you know what? That's probably something um, that we can talk about in the <coughs> tutorial room. That's probably a better way to, and then we can, I can, you know, we can talk about your system in particular. Mm -hmm. Have less slower or so. Why not have 18? 18. So you just have larger numbers that have the higher force and therefore you're not doing as fast clicking, given that you've got a constant conjugation of time. I mean, but uh, you, I mean, you'd have to, it, you know, you have to make choices at some point. And so we, you know, made that, that choice and then sort of went and saw how many we were going to need. You know, to reconstruct it statistically. I guess you you could do it. I'm not sure what the what the real advantages right. that would be. Or do you have?